We've got a couple of folks still logging in here, but uh, we'll turn our attentions to uh, today's uh, adult forum. Uh, we are uh, blessed uh, to be joined, as typically we are on Sunday mornings and have been for a while, uh, to one of the newer members of our community and uh, who has um, um, just um, plugged in so nicely uh, with us over the course of the last a couple of years, really, and I don't want to take too much of his story away from you, but um, we're grateful for uh, John Sweeney agreeing to uh, share some of his story and his, he and his wife's story with us today. Um, as you know from the from the advance information, um, uh, John's wife Virginia uh, is. Uh, um, uh, uh, living with Alzheimer's, and they, consequently, they both are living with Alzheimer's as as a result, and uh, and the journey that they've been on together uh, is a powerful story, and uh, we're grateful for John's willingness to be vulnerable with us uh, to share this uh, really authentic truth, uh, and to uh, invite uh, us into um, uh, this story with you. We're grateful. And uh, and where that will go, John. I'm gonna just turn things over to you. I will kind of keep an eye on on the crowd and see if there are questions that get raised. I invite you to just raise your hand or put a note in the chat, and I'll um, I'll I'll moderate as I often do uh, the sort of conversation that um, that this may elicit. Uh, and uh, if you need anything else from me, John, just ask. Oh, you got to unmute though. Step one. <laughs> we see your screen, John, but we don't hear you yet. This is good. <clears throat> look at this. look at his opening sign here, Bill. Bill. Still waiting for your for your audio, John. It's muted. Now can you? Yes, there you are. Oh, yeah. Hang on just a minute. I've got to get one more resource working here. Sure. And that is my iPad and my Apple Pencil, and we'll be underway. There we go. Well, this story happened because for the last couple of years, I've been doing uh, mostly travel shows for the Minneapolis Public Schools Adult Education, and the leader, Sandy, knew about Virginia, but she had never met her. And so last winter, I think it was about in February, she asked me if I would do my story for them, which I did, and that's how this came about. And the, um, so we'll talk about a 70 year journey with Virginia and I, but uh, if you look over here, that that's about two thirds of the way through that 70 year journey. Yeah, is so when, uh, John, I'm just gonna I'm jump in real quick. Your what you're sharing with us right now is is your Zoom display and not the screen you wanted us to look at. So, um, oh, you may, maybe stop sharing and then start again and just grab the right. Okay, very good. Um, let me get. Um, yeah, I can see it here, but apparently you can't see it there. All right, let's stop. All right. Yep. Uh, now share. No. Yep. We had it for sure. a moment, yeah. but there. Now we're looking at your slides. Okay, and let's see if you're seeing a bigger version of it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Good. Hey. Right. Well, you you heard my other story, but. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Sponholm talked about the journey started, uh, the journey unknown, and there was talk about that this morning. And as you can see, that Alzheimer's route, when we turned that corner, that was a journey unknown for us. 
And I'm going to chronicle the story of the life before the discovery of the disease, the milestones and struggles and all aspects of living with this terrible disease, because it is a terrible disease. A lot of heartaches, but I'll share some delightful humor incidents that kind of help take some of the pain out of it. And dementia affects nearly every American that has either someone in their immediate or extended family or among friends. There's over 90,000 diagnosed cases in Minnesota alone. And my guess is there may be as much as 10,000 undiagnosed that we'll find about it. So like road signs along the highway, I'll share how we saw signs as we went along. And um, uh, we came to the Alzheimer's route, the, uh, uh, the turn in the road here uh, in 2009. Oop, I, I lost my, hang on just one minute. And we'll start the journey. It started almost 72 years ago, 71 years ago, in a little town of Alpha, Minnesota, down in Jackson County. And I want to take particular note of the hair here, just in case you thought I was born the way I look now. <laughs> I did this have is... hair once. And this ancient document. I want to point out it goes back to the 23rd day of June in the year of our Lord 1950 and that's where the journey started with Virginia and I and on our 65th wedding anniversary someone had published or sent into the St. Paul paper an article that they had been married 65 years in June so I sent this one in and it got published and there was a, an expression at the bottom of it that I shared and it said, uh, I said to Virginia one time, you know, as an old bulgy, bald, paunchy octogenarian, I, I said to Virginia, honey, with your good looks, you could have married a man with hair that wasn't overweight, to which she replied, I did. And so we, there's what 70 years change can make. And my, how things change over seven decades. And this is what 70 years hath wrought. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this was uh, my 90th birthday party. And you'll see right here in the middle is a couple. And I want you to note that um, we are holding hands here. And I'll have to tell you that that's been going on for 71 years because on our first date, I took her to a movie in Jackson. And about halfway through the movie, I mustered up the courage to boldly reach over and touch her hand. She didn't move it. <laughs> and I've been holding her hands ever since then. But Virginia suffered a lot of trauma in her childhood, and I've often wondered if that has any effect whatsoever on what's happened to her. Here's a picture from the funeral of her father just three months before I met her. She lost her mother to diabetes when she was 12, and she lost her father at, in an accident in, um, in 1949 when she was 17. Uh, there's so I never knew a mother and father-in-law, but this couple right here, her uncle and aunt from Cloquet were the closest thing I ever had to uh, a mother and father-in-law. And they were, um, they treated her, well, she was the daughter they never had. So they treated her like their own daughter. So about two thirds of the journey, the 70 year journey, um, long before Alzheimer's, we bought long-term care insurance. And um, we bought that from a company called Bankers Life Assurance, which later was sold to Transamerica. And we purchased it when we were on vacation in Arizona. And that's fairly significant as we get along a little further into the story. You'll see why that was significant that it was bought there rather than in Minnesota. 
And so our first indication, at least to me, that anything was wrong was on my 80th birthday party in 2009. There's our eight, uh, nine grandchildren. The, our children and their spouses detected things that I had not seen because I was just too close to her. And I had a few months of denial. I just wasn't ready to accept that. But then finally we did. And so we saw a neurologist and the first thing that uh, he wanted to do is have a brain scan. And you can see all of the equipment on the left and you can see uh, Virginia there with a cap on kind of a little like Esther Williams. And uh, all of these things here are electrical contacts that, that they put in that cap on her head and so she looked like Esther Williams. And she looks like she was enjoying the session there. She's smiling, but Virginia has been smiling most of her life until just recent years. And so the diagnosis was Alzheimer's. And it was shocking news, scary thoughts, because I had read enough about Alzheimer's that I was aware of the likely outcome. The average life when diagnosed is from five to seven years. Fortunately, we're now in our 11th year, and I thank God frequently that we still have that. But it panicked my aged brain that the love of my life could be lost to me. And when you think of Alzheimer's, uh, a lot of the celebrities, and here's a list of some of the better known ones and how long they lived. And that's what scared me. Uh, Charleston Heston lived five years after his diagnosis. Glenn Campbell lived six years after diagnosis. Ronald Reagan lived 10 years after diagnosis. And the great Pat Summit, the coach of the uh, Tennessee basket, women's basketball team that won so many championships lived five years. And so, as you can imagine, just tore me up emotionally. And the other thing that I realized that our life savings might be facing a raging forest fire of dementia expenses. Very expensive medication. I mean, it's not like buying Bayer aspirin. Um, respite costs somewhere before she went into memory care. We did have some respite and I'll be talking about that a little later. And then the horrible cost of memory care. And I thought of an analogy that you know, this journey was like loading our life savings on the back of a flatbed truck and heading down that journey. And every time you hit a bump in the road or a roadblock, some of our life savings spilled off, never to be recovered. But here was the support. There's our five adult children have done just outstanding um, support uh, during this time. Our daughter-in-law said to me early on, Dad, you're not in this alone. And that really resonated with me. So some of the signs you see along the road, uh, signs of recognition. Our daughters were visiting us one time and she called me aside into the bedroom and said, uh, who, who are these two ladies that are visiting with us? And watching television one night in the den, she's in the living room, she came in, she says, come on, let's get going. I said, where are we going, dear? Well, my husband, John's at the airport, we gotta go get him. And then frequently she was wondering, when is my daddy coming to get me? And then as a family dinner one night at our place, our oldest son got up to get another cup of coffee. And she said, sir, would, would you bring me a cup of coffee? You know, that's her firstborn. And then we were at a fundraiser for my grandson-in-law who was running for office. And Virginia came to me and she said, that young gal is going to take me and show me where the bathroom is. Well, that young gal was her beloved granddaughter. And she would frequently uh, 
talk about her parents and I got to call my mother and ignorantly I would say to her honey don't you remember at our age we don't have living parents well fortunately there was two very professional ladies that I crossed paths with Lori LeBay the lady that the founder and the CEO of Alzheimer's Speaks and Karen Clavers of Ling Bloomston you met Carolyn about a year ago she did a um, a forum, uh, an adult forum, they cautioned me that you don't do that because it could be traumatic for her that she might think that it recently happened and, and be like mourning. So uh, they taught me how to get in the moment with her and tell her things that make her comfortable. And I got to tell you that to begin with, it was a little uncomfortable being deceptive to the love of your life. But if anyone can do it, an Irishman can. And then we had what I call the affectionate stage, super affectionate stage. Oh, I loved it. But uh, there would be uh, somewhat embarrassing displays of affection in public. <laughs> and uh, I've done a lot of work. Roseville has what they call the uh, the community action, they very proactive in, in Alzheimer's and dementia. And so I was on, a, Virginia and I were on a panel a few years ago, and uh, the moderator asked me a question. I answered it the best of my ability, and he turned to Virginia and he said, uh, Virginia, do you have anything to add? She says, oh, she says, I love my husband. He's been such a wonderful husband. I've been so happy married to him. And it's a crowd of about 35 people. They just bust up laughing. So when they quieted down, I said, she thinks I've been a good husband. I am so grateful for memory problems. So they had another round of laughter. And then the anxieties increased. She's afraid her mother would be worried, concerned about her grandmother. Uh, she wanted to call them. Well, that was a little difficult. I'm up against the wall there. So being a bright young Irishman, I suggested, why don't we send him an email? So I get out my email account and type a, rec uh, a letter or an email and she noticed this. She says, John, that's addressed to you. Well, I've been pretty quick on the uptake. You have to be, you know, and I said, honey, don't you remember? Whenever I send an email, I always copy myself so that I can look and see if I have to resend something. And so I got by with that. And then we created uh, a Gmail account for Tud and Genevieve Verdick, who died, both of them in the, in the, and surprising, we send emails to them and we get emails back from them and we read them. And the next thing, of course, that came, there became a time when Virginia no longer could put together the steps necessary to create a meal that, you know, the, the processing thing. So I'm conscripted into service and I had never boiled water before, let alone prepare a meal. And so one night I'm, I'm preparing the meal she's sitting and watching me and I'm as frustrated as a one armed paper hanger with a bad case of the itch. And I didn't know what I was doing and she could see my frustration and felt I needed some help. So she turned to me and she says, where is your wife? And I pointed right at her. You're not my husband, you're too old. <laughs> so she still sees herself as that 19 year old beauty that I married. And then as these things happen, I realized that I'm going to need some respite, some free time and we, we go to Costco and at Costco, you put the cart in one line and, and the, the members go to the other line. There's a sign clearly said, she wouldn't let go of that cart. She was hanging on to it because that was ours and it made quite a scene. And then we were at a grocery store and we, there was a lady ahead of us with things on the, on the belt and we put our things on the belt. She reached down and pushed the lady's stuff ahead of her out of the way and then held her hands on the belt and, and you know, cause she's afraid someone is gonna take our stuff. And I said, honey, let's step back here. Well, then you get yourself up here. <laughs> so 
uh, that's when we decided if I'm going to do some errands, I better have some respite. So we signed up with Ling Bloomston, and that's the group, the Ling Bloomston, uh, the gathering, that's the group that uh, Carolyn Clever uh, heads. And two days a month there, and then two days a week at um, uh, Salvation Army's facility. And then about that time, there was an article in the Minneapolis Tribune that our daughter-in-law pointed me to about a new uh, group in Roseville, a new support group called Memory Cafe, the first one in the United States. It had started in England. And so we started attending there uh, once, uh, twice a month. And um, KSTP did an interview with us out there. And I'll, or, well, first I'm gonna share that, that <laughs> The, uh, the piggy bank started siphoning off about the time we went to respite care because it was fairly expensive. But now the story about- Welcome back. It's a startling statistic here in Minnesota. More than 90,000 people have Alzheimer's disease. Now nearly one in every three seniors who dies each year also has Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia. And now there's a program in Roseville that is offering some new hope. Photojournalist John Gross has the story. <sighs> memory cafe where memories are in this moment it's a unique support group because it's for both the person with alzheimer's and their care partner you go for the camaraderie and this group brings that back annie and then there was that <laughs> <laughs> and it sure helps there are our people with alzheimer's because they need that laughter i like doing that <laughs> i'm good at that <laughs> Everybody's laughing and clapping, and now the person who was anxious feels comfortable. It gives you a chance to just talk, just release what's bothering you. Well, Lori LeBay started one of the first memory cafes in the U.S. Now there's close to 100 all over the country. You know, cheer you up when you come in. They make you feel welcome. And it's so popular in Roseville, Arthur's Memory Cafe has two groups. I was probably in denial for almost a year, and I realized that, uh, you know, that that's the hand we've been dealt, and unlike poker, you can't call for new cards. I meet other people who have problems like I have. Mm -hmm. And so about that time, uh, I thought I should probably do what I should have done when we bought the long-term care insurance. I should have read it, and I did read it and I didn't like what I was reading. I wanted memory care if needed to be done in a specialist facility for uh, memory care uh, because of they're required by law to be trained in dementia awareness. And so I started corresponding with, with the, uh, Transamerica and this is kind of what they, they told me that uh, this, she has to be in a facility that satisfies the policy's definition. And then they go on to de describe that as a licensed nursing home. <clears throat> and so with a lot of correspondence and phone calls, I'm getting nowhere is with Transamerica because they are not going to recognize a memory care unit as, as acceptable. So I started making noises. First off, I contacted the Minnesota Commerce Department then I, I started writing to every media I could think of, KSTP, WCCO, Star Tribune, the Pioneer Press. And because of all of the noise I made, the Minnesota commissioner invited me to testify at a Commerce Commission hearing in St. Paul in August of uh, 2015. And you know, one has to be his or her own advocate when you face these roadblocks and, and things. And so for financial reasons, my testimony was for financial reasons, I may have to put her in a nursing home, in which case they, they would have to pay, so why not pay for the best service? And carriers were crying about their claims uh, because they had no uh, empirical data when they started writing these policies. 
and uh, people like myself were complaining because they weren't honoring their obligation and they were tripling. And one of the um, other testimonies there, Mary Frances Price uh, was a colleague of an attorney that had done some work for us on um, end of life type things. And so she came to me after my testimony and said, you know, I have a litigation going against Transamerica. If, if you would like, and just pay me for the time that I spent, I'll take your case. Best $500 I ever spent, because of the $500, she got a concession letter from the president of Transamerica that says we remained unable to agree, but as a resolution, they approved Cherrywood Point for alternative care at full nursing home benefits. However, uh, waiver of premium is not applicable. And normally waiver of premium is when you file a claim uh, that's included. And so we agreed as a compromise. Okay, we'll accept that. So now if we file a claim it should be a slam dunk. Stay tuned. And then the anxieties continued. Uh, she couldn't find the baby. She'd wake up in the middle of the night, just panicking. Something was burning on the stove. Her daddy was waiting for her downstairs. We'd be awake for hours. And then we went through what I call the depression stage where she knew what was happening to her. She was aware and she would say to me, are you going to put me away? God, that just tore up my heart. I just want to die. And you can imagine how scary that was for me. And then as we're going along the road, the next roadblock that came about was I had my fourth heart attack. Uh, in 1986, I had uh, angioplasty, they didn't have stents. 96, I had bypass, quadruple bypass. 2004, I had four stents. And in 2016, I had another stent. And it scared the living bejabers out of our family because Virginia couldn't live alone. And so Cherrywood Point was under construction at the time. And uh, it's a facility that has uh, memory care as assisted living and independent living. And so there was five offspring that put a full court press on us to move to Cherrywood Point. There was absolutely no way of resisting that. <laughs> and, and I was kind of laying a little guilt trip on them, but a month or two in, <laughs> into our stay there, we moved in. <laughs> And in 2017, in uh, independent living to start with, they had happy hour. They had entertainers coming. A guy was playing accordion and Virginia was bobbing her head and her feet were going. So I took a little video that sent to the kids. And I said, I hate to admit this, but actually we kind of enjoy it here. There was a massive sigh of relief all over North America. And so it's decision time in 2019. It became aware to me and to the family that I probably could no longer provide the care uh, that Virginia needed. First off, we needed to get some sleep. We were just zombies because we'd be awake for hours during the night. And so we had a family conference, all five kids, our daughter in Toronto was on the phone with us uh, in a speaker phone. And I said, are you absolutely certain this is what we wanted to do. There was a, re a resounding five that said yes. And so uh, we made the decision. I signed her up for memory care. And that was the first time I realized that our life saving was under a full frontal assault. <laughs> uh, but notwithstanding that, and notwithstanding the hurt and the realization, one of the things that gave me some comfort is her room is really very homey. This is a view of it. Uh, she's got a bed, she's got a 
couch. She's got a chair. She's got a television. She has her own bathroom and and shower. She has her own cupboard and sink. It's a it's a, a little studio apartment. Uh, I want to point out that uh, she even has a, a nightstand here, and that plays a role in the story a little later on. So new anxieties um, continued. I would kiss her goodnight, and she'd beg, aren't you going to stay with me? Aren't you going to sleep here with me? I want to go with you. I want to go home. And she was constantly asking the staff, where's my husband? And then comes the time when she didn't know me anymore. But she was very devoted to her husband. She just didn't know who he was. And she thought another man was John, her husband. I walked in one time, she was holding hands with old Tom. And, and I tried to gently talk, talk away. And she said, no, this is John, my husband. We've been married a long time. And the caregiver has to realize at a time like that. It's not your loved one, it's the disease. And you better, better be a little comfortable in your own skin. One other time, there was an old boy sitting with his walker in a chair, sound asleep, and she thought it was me, and she was wanting to go. She goes up, slams the walker into him and says, come on, let's get going. And so I, I sent, sent the, the, the picture to the kids and, and uh, they said, well, no wonder she was confused. He's an old bald coot just like you. Not only that, he's got a green jacket on. She probably thought he was just another John Deere salesman. But these are very common in memory care. And so it's probably time now that we, that we uh, apply for uh, coverage. And so I make application and instead of getting an approval, which should have been a slam dunk, we get into a pen pal relationship. They had no intention of honoring their obligation. They just wanted to write back and forth and put in. Maybe that the client would die or uh, we'd get tired of pursuing it. <clears throat> and so uh, the next road sign was the road was closed by Transamerica. I had to mean, that was it, that was final. And so what did we do? We went back to the same attorney to Mary Norton Price or Mary uh, Price. And um, she was the one that actually uh, uh, got the concession of Transamerica five years ago. Uh, and one of the interesting things, the contact that I had when, when I couldn't reach Mary, I would contact through one of her helpers and it was a gentleman by the name of Abe Hunter. I don't know if you've ever heard that name before or not. Yeah, that Abe Hunter. He was my contact five or six, was several years ago. And so I got to know him fairly well. I had never met him, never seen him, but I knew the name. So, and so Mary cited this Arizona statute that essentially says that no long-term care insurance policy uh, may uh, deny cover or may require coverage by a nursing home only. It's very clear that statute was enacted in 1990. Our policy was dated 1996. Again, should be a slam dunk. Oh, I'm sorry, I lost it. So then Mary filed a complaint with the Arizona Corporate Commission because it, when the policy was bought in Arizona, and so uh, that's where we went and nothing happened for a long while. So I suspect that our complaint probably laid in the C pile. You know, you've heard about an administrator who's got the A, B and C pile. I think our complaint happened that it was laying on the C pile. So we never uh, heard from him for a while. So Mary referred us to a colleague attorney from another firm that specialized in this type of litigation. So we had a schedule on a Tuesday to meet with that attorney to start the litigation on the Friday before that Tuesday, I got a call from Transamerica telling me that Virginia had been approved. And I, that seemed to be some sense of urgency because they faxed the application, which tells me there probably was a requirement to report back to Arizona. 
not only that, that there was waiver of premium, which <laughs> so we we got the pump prime and then started to flow. And then what other roadblocks should show up? You guessed it, COVID in the spring of 2020. And COVID came over Cherrywood like a black cloud. Uh, we had an abrupt shutdown of everything, including memory care. For five months, I couldn't get in to see Virginia. But the staff had done, a, I thought, a very good job. They had iPads, and they would go into the room of the resident and allow them to FaceTime with their loved ones. And I thought that was great, but I had a little trouble. I felt time pressure because I didn't want to talk too long because other people were waiting for their turn. So my son, the youngest son, suggested to me, Dad, why don't you put an iPad in there? And I said, well, son, your mom can't answer that iPad. He says, Dad, they automatically answer. So I didn't know that. So we put the iPad in there. And here's the view. We've got a 56 degree view from my desk. I can see her bed. I can see her chair. I can see another chair and see the closet. And at that time, uh, they were feeding them in their rooms. And so I started eating at my desk and I dined with her virtually three times a day. And so that helped. I could talk to her anytime I wanted to. I could view her on my Mac. And there's, uh, there's what I saw on the screen of my Mac. I could view her with the iPad. As you, <laughs> as you can see here, I, for this purpose, I took a picture of the, of the iPad. But you can see that's what she sees. Uh, and I can see what she sees. But I'm up there <laughs> taking a picture of it. And I end up in the picture. And of course, uh, I can put it on my iPhone and hold it from anywheres, anywheres I am. Uh, the kids from anywheres in the world can dial in and see their mother or grandmother and talk to her. So I can prop it up against the Kleenex uh, box. And here's what she sees. There's my head on top of a long shaft. And she can't always tell when I'm talking to her, she'll go to the front door. She doesn't know who I am. But the staff will point to her and they'll say, uh, Virginia, there's your husband, John. My, you got long legs. And then I watched when they were giving her the COVID test. And the nurse, of course, knew I was watching. So she'll turn and talk to me. Now, I want you to note that this is probably an activity that Virginia would not number among the top 10 of her enjoyment as you watch the reaction. <laughs> Those two staff members there are, they're just great. They treat Virginia like their own grandmother with the love. Notice this, I, I just, can't say enough about them. And then the next thing, remember the nightstand? She fell against that nightstand and I was able to see her early in the morning with this big red blotch on her face. I called the staff and we got her bundled up and took her to St. John's to get stitched up. And now you see the nightstands there, not there anymore. Something that should we should have realized. And also you notice the bed is pretty close to the floor we took the um, we took the bed frame out from under it so that it's right close to the floor. And um, if she falls, she's not going to fall all that far, and she's not going to fall in. Oh, the other thing, notice up on the wall there, I got a sign there that says, "Don't put any furniture in this area, a uh, chair or anything else." And she continued to worry about the baby. So Carolyn Claver gave me a doll a number of years ago, and I didn't want to give it to Virginia during that um, early stages because she'd know it was fake. But 
There she is, watch how she cuddles that baby, she talks to it. That has solved the problem with the baby. And last fall, before it got cold, we had COVID visits out in the courtyard and that big long table, the uh, resident would be on one end, the visitors would be on the other one, proper, properly masked. And you can see how she cuddles that baby and covers it with uh, with her jacket to keep it warm. But And my grandson who took that picture stated it very uh, succinctly, he said, Grandpa, it, I, I enjoy seeing how much comfort she gets out of that baby. But I gotta tell you, it tears me up to see we're at that stage in the journey. And so in the fall of, uh, in uh, August of 2020, I was able to go in as a designated caregiver with a mask and, and a shield. And Danny O'Donnell sings a song that expresses Together it. again, my tears have stopped falling. Love that song. The long, lonely nights are now at an end. The key to my heart you hold in your hand. And nothing else matters. And nothing else matters now. Cause we're together again. You notice everybody has always wanted to be number one, but notice the tag Sarah says, John, visitor, number one. That's not a ranking. Her apartment happens to be number one. <laughs> More impact from Cherrywood or from COVID. Cherrywood and a lot of the other facilities of caregiving are grasping for ways to increase their revenues. And so a year ago, over, well over a year ago, Virginia wouldn't swallow pills. It wasn't that she couldn't, she just wouldn't, she'd spit them out. So they crushed the medication and put it in, in uh, applesauce or pudding. It's a standard procedure. Almost a year later, they decided, oh, that's special medication. They wanted to charge me for it. I refused to pay. I said, there's nothing special about that. And, uh, and we were at an impasse and, and I like our staff members, but I told our manager, I said, you know, I, I value our friendship, but for $3,000 a year, I'd rather have my $3,000 in your friendship. And so she could, and we were not getting anywhere. We were really at an impasse. In the meantime, I learned that the Michigan attorney general had issued a cease and desist to nursing homes that are doing the same thing. And so this Last video- Last the attorney general served 11 facilities with- I shared that with our management and I said, look at how much fun the media fees. is having the with the Michigan signed, the attorney, attorney general. general said, quote, While we cannot say and is so a legal way for a business to charge all a of a sudden we're making some progress related to the and pandemic, we came to an we a settlement agreement and I'll share that with you in a minute. Twice what I didn't know at that same time, which probably helped me, is Cherrywood Point of Plymouth had gotten, was them. victim of a Carrie 11 documentary on elder neglect. And I don't think they wanted any more publicity. And also, I think they realized that if I won, because I would have gone to the Attorney General and probably because number one, they ratified that it was proper part of the procedure by doing it without charge to begin with. Number two, it is not listed in the, uh, in the list of special uh, charges. And so there's no question in my mind that I'd win. And I think they realized that if I won and it got some publicity, not only would they have to refund the charge to me, but to everyone else in the whole system that they were charging that through. So we settled up and benefit to both parties.
Number one, I would dispense Virginia's medication. And in so doing, I'd have almost unlimited access to her. I would be doing much of the work that they were paid for. And I could buy my medication from the pharmacy, saving almost $1,000 a year over the copay through their pharmacy. And I could fend off going to, because we're at level one, but each one of those levels are $1,200 a month increase. So by doing a lot of the things that I'm able to do now, I fended that off. And then come the time when she could no longer feed herself. And here's a little video that I took from my iPad watching her base the food. Breaks your heart to see it. But then we realize that, hey, uh, I better start feeding her. And so I do. You notice that I've got a mask and I've got a shield. And at this point, we still had to feed her. Now it's opened up a little. We can feed her out in the common area. So it ties me down, but it's the answer to a lot of, of the things. So even though, you know, it's a sad stage, I'm very grateful. I still have her. And uh, that's something to be grateful to God for. And anything I've ever read about public speaking, they always say, you want to start out by telling them what you're going to say. Then you tell them. And then you tell them what you said. So what I'll do is summarize what I said. But the Irish are known for limericks. So they never want to do anything other than a limerick. So let's do it in verse. At my 80th birthday party with a family gathering in the fall of 2009, the family noticed Virginia's memory problem they couldn't define. Our daughters had made observations that they brought to my attention, and they concluded that mom had memory issues that they were reticent to mention, things for which I was very unaware because of my closeness to her. I had missed many of the little indicators that would frequently occur but the family had seen the signs to them that were in plain view. And after that, I started seeing them too. Signs of forgetfulness, and it seemed to display more often than before. Observations, painful to me, seemed to be recurring more and more. And one painful example, she urgently called to my attention one day, her husband would be at the airport soon and we needed to be under the way. She needed to go to the bathroom at a family affair. That young gal here is going to take me and show me where. It was a granddaughter that she loved so very much in days of yore. And it was so painful to sad to see that my love didn't know her anymore. And our daughters had came to visit us at our apartment one day and she called me aside whispering, sadly, I heard her say, who are these ladies? We were talking with out there and fear shook through my frame as I became very much aware and slowly realizing I was losing the woman I'd loved for over 60 years. This terrible disease, Alzheimer's, was filling me with fears. So it seemed now was the time to explore with specialists in neurology at just what point in this heartbreaking path do we now seem to be? And so the doctor set up an appointment with neurotechnicians for a brain scan. And from there, he would know what was needed for a treatment plan. With an aviator style headgear with contacts and wires everywhere, it looked like a swim cap, the kind Esther Williams used to wear. And the diagnosis stung when the description of the problem was read. And I was shockingly informed at the news that I'd come to dread. Alzheimer's was the diagnosis, more news that hurt to the core, for I had read of many of the outcomes of this disease before, and my mind raced and thoughts buzzed violently in my aging head as I contemplated what sorrow, pain, and anxieties laid ahead. And as time passed, terrible anxieties burdened the love of my life. It pained me greatly to see the stress in her my beloved wife. Oh, we need to call my parents or grandmother. So they hear from me. Her parents had passed in the 1940s. 
and her grandmother in 1953. And she would panic searching for the baby was nowhere in sight. A horrible feeling, sobbing, kept away in the middle of the night. It soon became apparent caring for her was beyond my ability and painfully searching at this point, what could the answer be? And after counsel of the family, we soon became aware that the best solution for her was being a room in memory care. And as I filled out the application with my eyes filled with tears, I realized we would be separated for the first time in 70 years. So she moved into memory care in the month of January of 2019 and more evidence of cognitive regression was seen. But one of the most painful experiences not noticed before that most of the time she doesn't know who I am anymore but with everything we have lost and how our lives are stressed, I remember fondly my 70 years with her. I have been blessed. And so this is the end of the story, but fortunately it is not the end of the journey. Thank you. Any questions about what we're facing? Thank you, John. We are so grateful for um, your willingness to share so openly with all of us uh, this uh, amazing journey that you have been on with Virginia, uh, not only uh, the last 10 plus years, but um, but certainly uh, the entirety of your lives. Um, it, it is uh, profound. Uh, uh, that the ways in which God has been at work in you. Mm -hmm. I would uh, open things up with a question, and we have a little bit of time. So um, if you want to maybe um, stop sharing your screen, then it'll be a little easier for me to monitor the full gallery. Um, okay. Thank you. And um, hey, wait a minute, Evan. <laughs> I'm having a little trouble finding the. Uh... The cursor here to do no, that. I might be able oh, to what? your screen share as well. Let's see. I can't see my cursor. Uh oh. Um, Can you stop it? Let me see. I might be able to. Mm -hmm. Oh, hang on. I, I've got yeah. a button on my computer that can do it. That's great. So, um, you know, my question for you is um, you at one point in your story, you, you reflected early on with um, Virginia's diagnosis. You, you quickly, as many of us do, think about the, the people we know who have also been on this journey and and certainly some of those public stories with the celebrities um, that you mentioned. Um, all of them, all of their life trajectories from diagnosis to death is quite a bit shorter um, and, yeah. and what, what do you think, or what have you, uh, encountered in your conversations with physicians and caregivers? Um, um, why is it that you think Virginia's, um, um, story has had a longer trajectory relative to that? Well, as you know, and as I expressed, I'm very grateful for that and realize how fortunate we are. The only thing I can think of all of her life, she has been the picture of health until just very few years. I think that might have helped. Her body was strong. In fact, at 17, she won the Jackson County Health Queen from 4-H and went to the state fair to represent Jackson County. And she always has been very healthy. And as a layman, I think that might have helped her, her, her physical stamina because Alzheimer's not only affects the brain, but it affects other parts of the body that shut down, you know, and that for the most part hasn't happened yet. We are seeing some regression in that area, but that's kind of a long answer, but. <clears throat> I, and um, I would venture a guess in my unprofessional opinion too, that Virginia being surrounded uh, with such um, attentive care um, is also, you know, a big part of this and the decisions that you made early on in your process to get her engaged in things like the gathering and to be involved with the support groups that come along with that just help to 
um, encourage and um, sort of surround Virginia with a particular kind of care and attention that ultimately adds to uh, the, the, the relative quality of her life, right? And, um, and yeah. certainly and to I yours think, as well. That's another fortunate thing that we have as a family support because I have friends that are caregivers. They're in the minority, but that they don't have family support. Number one, the kids don't want mama or dad out in the public because they're ashamed. Or number two, they've read where if they sniff this or sniff that, that it'll soft solve the problem and this poor caregiver is in this journey all alone. And our neurologist said that there's some part of his practice that's so sad that the caregivers or their families are not supportive. So we are very fortunate and I thank God for that. Uh, Tony Sfam, you've got a question. Yes, I do. John, you kind of alluded early on in your presentation that uh, Virginia had, had had experienced a lot of trauma early in her life. Were you making some sort of connection between her trauma of early years and um, the onset of Alzheimer's? Yeah, and, but again, as a layman, I have often questioned, did that play any part? Because you can imagine how traumatic that would be to lose your mother when you were 12 and lose your father. And it was a tragedy loss of her father. Her father was a heavy drinker. And uh, I think some of her fears, anxieties of, of my daddy coming to get me, my guess is at some point, more than once at the 4-H club or something, he didn't show up when he should have. And he, he froze to death in a car because of drinking, that was a trauma. I don't know, no one knows what causes it, but I've often wondered, did that have any effect? One of the interesting things I intended to share, but I didn't, is when we signed up for the long-term care insurance, at, just at random, she was picked by an underwriter to ask a bunch of cognitive questions. Little did they know that we'd be filing a claim on her behalf 20 years later. By the way, if any part of this that you think would be of any help to anyone else facing this journey, it is on YouTube. And it's uh, a caregiver's journey, no, a couple's journey with Alzheimer's. And it'll come up fairly quick with just that. And, uh, and I did that particularly because for the last several years, anytime I've been called on, I've I've wanted to do whatever I can to raise the awareness of this horrible disease. And yeah. that was why I did it. The amount of um, advocacy work that you've had to do, um, not only for yourself and for Virginia, but um, that um, carries through to others as well. Um, it, I think it's one of the unfortunate uh, things about um, how those large corporations uh, function, and both in the insurance side and on the on the uh, uh, delivery side, that um, they try to keep you from talking to other people because they the more the more hidden these stories are, um, the the more likely they're to be able to sneak sneak one through. It feels like right, and so um, this public advocacy work that you're doing, John, is really really important, and and I hope By that. The way, all I'm I'm good friends again with our manager and the and director of nursing that I fought to the nail with. And I have to tell you one more funny about that. Recently, when Virginia was in the hospital for 10 days, they had issued a credit because there's two parts to the charge. One is the care and the other one is actually the rent and basic services. So they ended up with about $900 of credit, but in accounting for that, they reversed everything and they actually ended up with a $3,000 credit. So I went down and talked to Abby and I said, Abby, you probably will recall that when I've been inappropriately charged, I can be miserable, but I wanna be honest, Abby, I think I owe you $3,000. She got a big kick out of that. <laughs> but they, and, and so what, what the, the other thing they did, uh, 
the next step, they actually deposited money in my accounts instead of taking it out. So I snapped a screen print of it and sent it to my son. He said, Dad, I would not depend on long-term custody of those funds. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, these uh, these ethical decisions that you've been faced with in the midst of all of this is, is definitely uh, uh, part of the journey as well. Are there any other questions for, for John this morning? We've got just a moment or two. Paul Sponheim has his hand up. Paul, go ahead. Open up your microphone. Not yet. Yep. There, there you are. Might work. Yeah, there he is. Uh, John, I don't oh. have a question, but I have an appreciation. Uh, I am struck during this uh, account that you've given us. Uh, I'm familiar with most of the steps that you've identified, though uh, my walk with Nell was a little shorter. But what I've been struck by is how constant and steadfast your care has been. Uh, it's really a beautiful story and it's a wonderful example. So thank you for telling us this morning. Thank you, Paul. Let me share. I had a very good friend at Applewood. Um, he has since died, but before he died, his wife had cancer and he was the 24 seven caregiver and he had to do physical things, a lot of incontinence, just like caring for a, an infant, you know, and uh, someone said to him, Phil, how do you do it? He says, it's very simple. If the roles were reversed, she would do it for me. And, and that is our, well our role. Virginia would be the first and did <laughs> was my caregiver when I went through all of the heart disease problems. Yeah. yeah. So grateful for, uh, again for your uh, openness uh, with us and, um, and, and, and allowing us to enter into your story in this way. Um, we um, absolutely will continue to uh, um, hold you and Virginia and your ginormous family together in our prayers, uh, and and um, and recognize how much God has been at work, even in the midst of uh, this uh, disease and its progression. Um, that uh, God is doing some amazing things, uh, um, building your family in new ways uh, and helping you to see the world and helping the rest of us to see the world around us a little more clearly uh, and, and offering us glimpses of God's uh, redeeming love uh, through the, the care that we give to one another. We are grateful for this witness in this journey. And I am grateful for all of your presence today, uh, for our adult forum today. Please join me uh, one more time in thanking John for uh, his presentation today. Hey, Thank you, John. John. Glad to have you as friends. Let, let me, may I, may I get in a pitch from the radical left here? <laughs> Go, sure, Rick, we'll give you the last word. Okay. <laughs> Much of the trauma that John... And I'm sorry, I can't remember your wife's name. Virginia. Virginia have been through is is a problem that's generated by our economic system. We are a country who could eradicate that trauma by by single payer Medicare for all. It should be done. The cut. The country has the resources. The budget is, the budget can be expanded without, without care, without causing anything like the trauma that John and Virginia have been through. And um, remember that when you're thinking about it, please, because it's, it's totally avoidable. The, the not not the trauma of, of the journey, but the cost of the journey. It, that's that is inhumane. Anyway, that's it. It sounds like a good topic for another adult forum. Uh, so keep your uh, 
keep keep tuned. Uh, the um, uh, the there's another year of forums coming our way next uh, next starting next fall. We've got just a couple of weeks left. Uh, this coming Sunday on May 2nd, Pastor Ruth is going to um, help us dig into the book of Galatians a little bit, uh, Paul's letter to the church, uh, and um, and uh, and then on May 9th, we have uh, a, a guest presentation uh, on our, our uh, uh, growing partnership with Mental Health Connect and learning about uh, some of the um, uh, the opportunities uh, for tending to those in our in our midst who um, uh, suffer with mental illness and how we as a community can respond. Some great uh, things to share with you on May the 9th. Those are the next cup. Excuse me. That's going to be the 16th on May the 9th. Yeah, that's correct. Am I, remember? Am I getting it wrong now? Uh oh, read your emails. They're going to be more accurate than my brain in this morning. So let's Here, it's, with it's that. Lois Farrakh. Lois Frock is on May 9th. Yeah, a professor of early church history from Luther Seminary who's going to be uh, instructing us and and uh, sharing some insight from what the early church councils and how they um, uh, helped to shape the church that we live to in today. So that's on May 9th. Then on May 16th is, is uh, the uh, speaker for Mental Health Connect. And that will wrap up our season of adult forums for this year. And so uh, we are grateful for your participation. I wish you all blessings on this Sunday. And, uh, and thanks again, John, for your work today. Thank you all. Thanks, John. Bye.